Welcome everybody to today's live stream. Well, today's message is called A World Turned Crazy. So we're going to be studying the book of Revelation, and that's where we've been going. And we are coming to Revelation chapter 11. And we're going to go jump right into this. We're going to go fast. We're going to go furious and everything like that. So we're going to go right into this. There comes a time when there will be an open worldwide push for a centralized control of every single thing you own. Every aspect of life is going to be regulated and controlled by an elite class. And to get there, folks, take slow steps to set up strongholds in the human mind so the human mind will willingly give up all liberty and all freedom to be controlled by a benevolent state. The book of Revelation actually speaks of such a time, and we have seen that so far in our study of the book of Revelation, where all the how longs of humanity and angels are finally answered. Hope you understand when, when you go through this book of Revelation, you start in chapter four there, and all of a sudden you see the how longs of humanity being answered. How long will evil keep getting by with it? Never prosecuted, never thrown in jail. They keep getting by with it. How long, how long, O oh Lord, will finally be answered? In fact, in the book of Enoch, the book of Jasher, and the book of J Jubilees, though they're not canon of scripture, they are mentioned in the Bible. In fact, the book of Jasher is quoted in the book of Joshua concerning the sun stand still. These are just references that God uses. They're not canon of scripture, but it does tell a, a, of a time referred to as the days of Noah, what happened in Genesis chapter 6, where it became dark, evil, and so oppressive, and people were devoured and controlled by evil in such a degree that the righteous, it talks about how the righteous people on the earth cried out, how long, how long, O Lord, before you do anything about it? Even the an angels would carry the prayers up to, to God and say, how long, how long, oh Lord, will this keep going? And finally, God says, enough is enough. The line has been crossed. It's time to answer the cries of how long we all have about why evil prospers. They never get punished. They can steal elections. They can do all kinds of things. They commit crimes. They get away with it. It's just this insanity going on in the world and there comes a time when god says enough is enough that's what the book of revelation is about that a time when the true men of god grow fewer and fewer just like the book of jasher says a time when the church keeps warning humanity about what happens when you forget god you open up the door to the enemy to come in and nobody listens anymore why that is because many in the church join in the ways of the world and finally god's going to have a say Enough is enough. I'm going to do something about this. In the meantime, it's because of God's great mercy and grace. He doesn't want people to perish. He wants to bring everybody he possibly can into the kingdom of God. He knows when the last soul will be saved and the enough is enough is decreed. Okay. By God himself, not by man. Okay. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It's a time that's going to be just like the days of Noah where all the how longs are going to be answered. So, God did in the book of Genesis. And he, but he first he got his remnant together, Noah and his family, and they built an ark. During its construction, it took 120 years to do. Noah preached and warned humanity about the road they were traveling on. It ain't good. It was not good. There comes a time when God says enough is enough. Well, people complain, you know, that God's a God of love. How could he possibly send wrath upon the world? We weren't asked to be born. Uh, we can't serve a God that's going to be filled with wrath and make us suffer in the book of Revelations. Let's get rid of the book of Revelation. Let's make a new God, one we like that tickle our ears and Gucci goo us all day long. And so they made their own gods, even in the church, folks. Then a time is a coming when enough is enough upon the entire world. Well, God designed things so we learn to, like I said before, live responsible to the freedom he gave us to live within the boundaries of his love. God gave humanity inalienable rights that are all found in the Bible. Freedom of movement. Adam and Eve were free to move anywhere. They had freedom of speech. They had freedom to assembly together as families and fellowship with each other because that's what God wanted. They had, Adam and Eve had freedom to plan, build, and create. They had freedom from tyrannical systems of control. You know, they, God warned them, don't go to that tree. 
Are you going to be under some tyrannical control, you know, by knowing the knowledge of good and evil? And, you know, from these ideas that are all found in the Bible have become what as known as Western values. So what are Western values? Western values are freedom, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest, freedom from tyrannical government. You're innocent until proven guilty. You have a right to a speedy and fair trial. You have a right to free and fair elections. Okay, those are Western values. You have a right to live as a human being how you want to within certain limits that are imposed to keep evil in check so you don't go into a tyrannical state where you are dominated as a slave, a serf, okay? All this is based upon Judaic Christian principles that are found in the Bible. God did not want Israel to have its own human king, for example, because he foreknows the nature of central planning when it does. But they prevailed, so God says, I'll give you what you want, so he gave them King Saul, who was a large, very large, the Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> so God wants to teach free people that to be free, one must live responsible before God and man as the only way to maintain that freedom without stretching it to the limits of tyranny. He gave the Ten Commandments for that purpose and effect. Amidst this, the rebellious fallen angels seek to spin freedom and teach people they need tyranny and not freedom. That tyranny is true freedom because it gets things done faster. But this freedom stuff takes too long to get anything done. Let the fallen angels guide the world's elite to take control over everything and oppress you because that's freedom. That's what they teach us. In fact, the idea of the World Economic Forum, the World Government Forum, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the United Nations, uh, is to test this idea of freedom to the breaking point. That freedom stuff, they, they have reasoned as all very old-fashioned. It's oppressive. It's racist and all that jazz. You can't get anything done to solve make-believe problems. <clears throat> Excuse me, not make-believe problems, but problems like global warming, refugee crisis, to stop all wars, to, to, to redistribute wealth. I mean, um, I mean um, economic social justice um, and, and solve all the problems of the world. So who needs Christianity and its grace and its freedoms? That just takes too long. We need a new system. So let me quote from an article published by the World Economic Forum. You can go on their website and find this. It's, it's entitled, How Life Could Change in My City by the Year 2030. Oh, how nice. Listen to this wonderful world that the World Economic Forum and the world's elites want to do. Listen carefully. It's very short. It says, welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city, or should I say our city? I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or clothes. It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you consider a product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodations, food, and all the things we need for our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free. So it ended up not making sense for us to own any, own much. Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy, know where I can go and not be registered. I know that somewhere everything I do and think and dream of is recorded. I just hope that nobody will use it against me. Wow, what a utopia they got in store for us, man. Hmm. Let me go back and quote this. Notice, all in all, it's a good life, much better than the path we are on, where it became so clear that we could not continue with the same model of growth. We had all these terrible things happen, lifestyle diseases, climate change, refugee crisis, environmental debt, de degradation, and completely congested cities, water pollution, air pollution, social unrest, and unemployment. We lost way too many people before we realized we can do things differently. Folks, that's pure communism. <laughs> You don't own any property. They want to take your property away. They want to take your liberties and freedoms away. They don't want you to think. They want to track what you dream, what you buy, what you sell. They want to control. You know, uh, Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, even guess what? I mean, I bet you didn't know this. He wants, he says in his book or on his website, I can't remember right now, I'm pulling this from memory, that 
people eat too much meat. So therefore, they want to control how much food you eat, what you can eat and what you cannot, what you can buy and what you can sell. That's why I bring this up, because it connects to the book of Revelation and the mark of the beast, folks. That's what you're dealing with here. That's pure communism. It's pure Italian fascism rolled up in a benevolent, kind package, okay? On Klaus Schwab's website, he mentions using COVID-19 to bash the Western idea of freedom and liberty to its knees in order to embrace their benevolent control that I just described to you. He wants a centralized government to a group of narcissists who only dream of raw power only for themselves that's based upon the whims of their own ideas on how to make utopia really nice. How? By pitting people against each other, teach people how to destroy the family so the state is your mama and your papa and rob you of an assembly with other people so you cannot meet with them, you can't talk with them. Do you think something like that might be going on now? They want to take personal responsibility away, rob you of your thoughts, your ideas, and invention. Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum website is all about a great reset and using COVID-19 as a tool for the great reset of capitalism. That's their words, not mine. That's talking about bringing the world into one world government and economic form. This could be written off as a James Bond novel with some uh, diabolical bald-headed guy who has a cat and Jane Bond comes in to save the day. Sorry, there is no James Bond. Okay, he's going to save the day here. And um, he's trying to take over the world. And now, most of the world leaders go to this guy and most of them are in bed with him. Most of them share the same ideas. This is not some conspiracy theory. This is reality. You can read it on their website. Go to read the Rockefeller Foundation. They're very open and so easy to find the documentation and listen to the world leaders and what they say about the Great Reset and using COVID-19 to as a behavior modification technique to take your liberties and freedoms away so you get, uh, pardon my French, just, just you know, live off the breast of government oh save me it's it's evil they want the west to force it to willingly embrace their ideas to exchange everything for their peace and safety for free government handouts free stuff that'll control you in exchange for the liberty to kill the unborn abort babies a month after the birth to export and extol the great values of moral depravity and escape these uh, uh, health consequences by making new vaccines that are RNA so that you no longer are human. Boy, they got it all figured out. Um, they want to escape consequences for all that. They want to can uh, they want the, the church to to give up and roll over and play dead. Uh, so you have no friends, no fellowship. Unless it's approved by the state. They want to control every aspect of your life. In fact, I just read an out, um, a headline. I want to know if any of you listening in Scotland, please tell me the um, results of this. In Scotland, they are, they are trying to pass a law that will outlaw the Bible as hate speech. In Scotland, home of part of the John Knox Reformation. Scotland who sent missionaries all around the world, now becoming dark and want to outlaw the Bible as hate speech. That gets passed. That's going to come to world government. That's what they're after. Hmm. Tell me if that has come to pass yet. They, they, that's what they're doing. They want to give up your connection with your family. They want to give up everything because the government's going to keep you safe from disease, a disease, a COVID-19 disease with a 99% survival rate for young people and high as 90 to 95% for older people. And people with pre-existing con conditions who are usually most affected by the flu and other diseases uh, have a higher rate. Yeah, it is a real disease. I'm not downplaying it. But why in the heck are we shutting down everything for something that is not... Uh, as deadly as the Spanish flu was, or polio. I grew up in an era and time where we got sugar cubes for the polio vaccine. 
where the, where in uh, I think it was in a, a Pulaski or Wickville, Virginia, there was a polio ec- epidemic. It was three hundred miles or two hundred some odd miles away, and and so they shut that city down and started giving everybody around it the sugar cubes to vaccinate them. I mean, I I've, I've seen worse diseases. We I grew up in a t- time period at the tail end of smallpox. Now, as an infant, I didn't get the vaccine for it. Other people before me got it. I mean, they talked about it. It was still around when I was a kid in other parts of the world, but they eradicated it. I mean, come on. There are far worse diseases out there, and they're using this to behavior modification. No wonder Klaus Schwab was, has written a book called COVID-19, The Great Reset, for a purpose. I heard an old saying from years ago, which I grew up during the height of the Cold War, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And this was a saying that came out, I think, probably 19, I don't know, 70s or 80s. And it goes like this. You, you can only vote for communism once. You only vote for communism once. Think about it. Once you vote for communism, it doesn't go away. The Russian Revolution was a disaster. Communism was an absolute disaster. It took 70 some years before it fell. Now they want to implement this failed system worldwide. If COVID does not work to push everybody to give up their liberties and freedoms, uh, then they'll then guess what these elites are going to do? They're going to engineer another crisis to win the votes by fear, by raw power over climate change or code COVID 1000 or 100 or COVID 21 or implementing chaos in the streets. And that in a nutshell is what the great reset documentation says is its goals to reset capitalism to a communism state. And we see the world spinning and spinning and the corrupt and the wicked are never brought to justice. Great men and women of faith, just like in the book of Jasher, are passing away, and there's hardly anyone, barely anyone, will step up to take their place anymore. We used to have um, people from all the way back to the early 1800s, revivalists like uh, abolitionists uh, Charles Finney. You had all the way up to Dwight L. Moody, R.A. Torrey, and Billy Sunday, and you have all these people that are around and that held great meetings and crusades worldwide, drawing masses into the body of Christ. You had all the way up to the time of Billy Graham, people bringing, I, I grew up in that era, when people were going in these stadiums, masses of stadiums, masses amount of people getting saved. Evil was held in check, in this of order, but we have in the background a world elite at war at the time. Now, at the passing of Billy Graham, where is those people? We have the passing of great men and, uh, and women of God like us, like Rabbi Zacharias and other apologists out there. And now there's no, when they pass away, they, there used to be like Leonard Ravenhill would take the place of C.S. Lewis or somebody like that. But now there's nobody taking the place of those who pass on. That's a sign near the end. Just like it was in the book of Jasher. Okay, now we come to Revelations chapter 11. The church is taken away. That's what happened here. So that only the apostate unchurch of the one world religion remains. The world is taken over by these elites who prepare the way for all this to happen. Only the tiny, itty bitty little posted stamp of a nation called Israel remains. And, here, and Israel remains as the light, the last free nation on earth, where being responsible before God is the only way to be free. Okay. However, the globalist cabal is at work in that country at the same at the time of the end. And Israel at the time of the end is divided. It really is going to look bleak. All the Gentile nations will speak great swell smooth words to Israel, but they have this huge dagger behind there that betrays their true intent. Others in Israel will see them and say, oh, we got to join the global cabal. Has messages of God on earth and Marxism for all, except the elites, of course. The elites are exempt from Marxism, not you. Amidst this mess, God's going to send two witnesses to testify, warn, and display why evil is really evil and not as good as the world thinks it is. With that, we're going to turn to where John writes 
in the first uh, verse of Revelation chapter 11. So, get a Bible out, look it up. I'm going to read the verses out of the New King James here, and we're going to jump right into the study with that backdrop. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 talks about John and John writes then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying rise and measure the temple of God the altar and those who worship there okay well let's talk about measuring rods and what they symbolize traditional measuring rods were from 8 to 20 feet long that symbolizes ownership of the one who builds something as well as it was used for checking the flaws in a construction during the course of time that would cause the foundations of a splendid structure to possibly shift, crack, and weaken. So they always had to measure things and make sure everything was uh, is stable. Okay, that's the idea here. We see this same idea brought out in Habakkuk or Habakkuk in chapter 3, verses 6 through 16, when Habakkuk measures the earth and all that is in it, showing that God owns everything, how those assigned in Israel to keep things from shifting away from God's design intent, how they fell away. The sh uh, in other words, the, the foundation shifted, and it wasn't pretty, okay? And God was going to fix the foundation, and he did, okay? The same theme is seen in the book of Ezekiel, as well as measuring out judgment, in Ezekiel chapters 40 and 41. I don't have time to go through all those verses. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. Let's read it. But leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. This is incredible to me to read this. And so I want to I'm going to read from Dave, David Guzik's commentary to shorten it any lengthy explanations here. Uh, on this verse, so David Guzik's Bible study commentary reads like this concerning Revelation chapter verses 1 and 2 here. The holy city Jerusalem will be tread underfoot for a period of 42 months, which would equals 1,260 days, which is a three and one half year period. This trampling by the Gentiles probably takes place in the last half of the final seven year period described by Daniel in Daniel chapter 11 verse 26 and 27 when the Antichrist pours out his fury on the people of Israel described in Revelation chapter 12 verse 13 and 17 and Matthew 24 verses 15 and 28. Greek scholar A. T. Robertson says that to tread underfoot means to trample with contempt. Okay, end quote. The, this points to this 42 months points to a time at the middle of the tribulation. The church is gone. And most likely the apostate church is all that remains as part of the one world religion. People will still be saved during the tribulation, but all Gentile nations now are part of the global network of a one world government. Okay. And there's no free speech. There's only tyrannical control. There's total domination by the world's elite as uh, the world is population is just cannon father to further their Luciferian utopia. This leaves only Israel as the one to shine forth the ways of God. There is no sovereign nation anymore. Only Israel remains sovereign because of its loyalty to God. There's no USA. There is no free world. Like the World Economic Forum article says, how life could change in my city by the year 2020, it says, welcome to the year 2030. Once in a while, I get annoyed at the fact that I have no real privacy, nowhere I can go and not be registered. I know that somewhere everything I do and think and dream is, of is recorded. I just hope that nobody uses it against me. That, that describes a place of what they want. It lines up. We'll see this in the book of Revelation with the mark of the beast, where, the, where you're going to be tracked. Everything you think, everything you dream of, everywhere you go is going to be tracked and monitored, where life is controlled to the point how much meat you can eat, what you can buy and sell. Uh, everything is tracked, watched, and followed, where folks act like drones and think and believe that this is the best life possible. The Gentile world at that time, it will become very anti-Semitic and desires to wipe Israel off the face of the earth forever. Why? Well, they're a sovereign nation, a little post-it stamp, and they fly in the face against the globalistic, communist, fascist, whatever you want to call it, and uh, they, 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 they buck the system because they still worship the Lord our God. Many still desire to live free 
and not be tracked and controlled by those who want their death in Israel at that time. This is what this is describing. I'm going through a lot of Bible prophecy and what a lot of scholars have said, and I'm modernizing it so that you all can understand what this is about. Since the elites think they control all the world's resources, this brings me back to the episodes 10 through uh, 13 here. They think they control all the world's resources. The first half of the tribulation, God shows them who is really in control. The, the seals of judgments are open that will divide people into the household that they love the most and to whom they want to control them the most, okay? And then you have the trumpets of war sounds and for the trumpets of the uh, of the trumpets of war that sound we see that one third of the world's food supply is gone but israel's food supply remains intact okay with that the true church is gone and the elites see this as an opportunity to get rid of all vestiges of god owning the world wipe it off the map let's get rid of israel at the time they got the food they have the resources. One third of the world has been wiped out. Now they're going to attack Israel because they are just plain nuts. It's a world turned crazy. That's what's happening here. God's going to turn them over to craziness. He, that's how God does. He makes a wicked for a day of doom. And those who join forces with them will not go unpunished. Okay. He gives you over to a reprobate mind. He gives you what you want. Okay, enough's enough. And in and, and doing so, some people sicken of it, repent, return to him, and others will not. Okay? So, the Gentile nations will treat Jerusalem and the Jewish people with utter contempt after pretending they are their friends for 42 months or 1,060 days. The Bible number meanings here help uncover why the numbers 42 and 1260 were used in this chapter, okay? 42 means this. It literally means this. Its root meaning means op oppression, oppressor, kill. It means the bear that kills. It's the Baal or, Baal or anti-God spirit in Hebrew would be the anti-God spirit that produces evil servants. So these Gentiles must be in league with the Antichrist and one world government to be the oppressors in order to kill and kill Israel because they are influenced by the anti-God or who we call the Antichrist spirit that produces evil servants for this task. That is why the number 42 is used in there. What, what is the number 1260? Mean? The root meaning of 1260, it means the ways of corruptness and immorality with the world's prostitute leads to the house of the dead. That's the root meaning. How? By corrupting or defiling the knowledge of God. So they're going to bring and corrupt the knowledge of God by bringing sexual immorality with the world's prostitute to lead you to the house of the dead. So next, another secondary meaning or shade of meaning to 1260 means from its prime factor meaning, which is uh, 2 times 2, 3 times 3, times 5 times 7, or you have 4, 36, 180 equals 1260. I won't get into all that. Uh, so the actual meaning here is idolizing an enemy adversary. You idolize a mighty man of valor, a gibberim, one of renown, and uh, in order to produce a self-exaltation that leads one to the house of the dead. It's going to be a great time of pride and humor, hubris. We have arrived. We have arrived at Utopia. We're there, is the idea. And they're worshiping one person named of a renown, a mighty gibberine, a man of renown. And they idolize him. We see that in the Bible with the worship of the Antichrist, don't we? Both the root meaning of 1260 and its prime factor meanings indicate a link to the works employed by the one worlders and the Antichrist to corrupt the knowledge of God by means of flattery and intrigue, just like the book of Daniel talks about, by using and making of strongholds in Israel to operate a fifth column of social and political saboteurs to bring Israel in line with the one world government or of Babylon, as prophesied in Daniel and later on in Revelation chapter 17. Okay, these numbers <laughs> line up with the meaning of the book of Revelation and the content and the context of the book of Revelations to a T. And I find things like that fascinating. 
how God will use things like numbers like this to add depth to the text that brings so many prophecies about the Antichrist together all in one place, like a focal point to this one point here. And, and even how the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and claim he is in God, defiling the sanctuary and corrupting the knowledge of God. It's all there. It's all there in those numbers. But God has a monkey wrench. And it looks really bleak at this time. The church is gone, but Israel remains. And Israel, as scholars say, will make a treaty with the globalist elite, like it says in the book of Daniel. This globalist cabal, they'll make a, a deal with. So what does God do at the beginning of the tribulation? He's going to send two witnesses to Israel to draw folks there and also the world back to God if they want to hear one last call before enough is enough. What happened? So we see this, and it says here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So they're going to be prophesying against the whore of Babylon, its control, the worship of the Antichrist. That number, that's the meaning of that number. They want to stop people from going into the house of the dead. That's their intent, Okay. In the sackcloth, they're doing it humbly. They're not these prophets on TV that we see today. Very proud. I prophesy. I'm a pro. You know all that stuff. These people are very humble because they they spend time in heaven before they came to earth. We'll talk about that in a second. And they know God. They're just humble servants. They're going to do their job. It's over. They're gone. Okay. They're humble servants. And they're also sackcloth means great weeping because you see the death and destruction that's going to come on the rebellious. No matter how much you try to warn them, you're weeping and crying like Jeremiah did, trying to implore them to return, and these people won't. You, these two witnesses will reveal the loving nature of freedom that's in, in the boundaries of God's love to a T, and nobody will pay attention to them, okay? Very few will. There will be in Israel, and maybe some in the world, you know, it's, it's what Bible scholars all, you know, bat around about. In my opinion, there are people going to be saved in both Israel and in the world through these two witnesses. Okay? These two witnesses are going to uh, be talking about uh, tactics employed by globalism and its antichrist leader. Okay? They're going to talk about it. They're going to expose it. Okay? So let me go to the next verse. So the two witnesses will confront the globalists and show them that they do not measure up to, to God who owns everything. See, the globalists will think that they own the world. They are the business leaders and the major corporations who think they own all the world's uh, commodities and all the production means. They, have, they own all the resources of the world. They own it all, baby. And they're going to make utopia because God's ways ass takes too long we're going to do it bigger better we're going to build back better that's what they're that you know build back better was joe biden's campaign speech but did you realize build back better is from the world economic forum before biden used that he borrowed it from the world economic forum as his campaign slogan do you understand where you know only one vote to communism that's all it takes you know hmm. just think about it so they think they own everything, and they know how to redistribute it, how to help people. That's all about help. It's a very Luciferian light. It's illumination. You know, we're going to have benevolent genocide, reduce the world's population without them knowing it. So we'll have sustainable levels of enough serfs to, to, so the elites can live ostentatiously and wipe their feet on everybody else. Okay, that's, that's their mindset here. But God has another plan. Those war trumpets sound during this, these periods. And so these two witnesses will confront the globalists and show them that they do not measure up to God who owns everything. One third of the world's food supply is now gone. The economic system based on Marxist redistribution is threatened. Their order is going to is now threatened. And these two witnesses are testifying about this and they're getting angry at these two guys. So who are these two witnesses? Revelation 11 verse 4 says this. Of the new king james these are two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the god of the earth again david gusick and, and, and commentary reads this 
And I quote, the description of these two witnesses, one most likely is Elijah, the other might be Moses, who turned water into blood, or he might be Enoch, who did not see death as Elijah did. Like Elijah, he walked with God despite his frailties, uh, helped God measure things. So I won't get into all that. So we know we pretty much know that one of the witnesses will be Elijah. The other could be Moses or it could be Enoch. It's a toss up. Enoch and Elijah, uh, their histories involve things about the sky. So does Moses. Moses was was used to turn waters to blood. So it's a toss up in that. So I really don't know who the second witness will be. Possibly Enoch, possibly Moses. I'll let you decide on that. I don't, and to me, it's not important who they are uh, until they get here. Okay. And who, when they get here, then it will be known who they are. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 5 and 8. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours the enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. This is why the globalist cabal hates them. They are powerless for three years. They're seeing their, the earth burn up. They're seeing one third of the world's economy and one third of the population uh, wiped out. Their whole economic engine is threatened. Redistribution, their whole method of controlling the world is sh being shaken right now. And why? Well, as, as, uh, Guzik says in this verse, these have the power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters to turn into blood and strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire, end quote. This will all happen in Israel. And at the same time, all this is happening and the global cabal is getting mad at these guys and they can't do anything. No matter, they're, all their plans are being frustrated about how to get rid of them. They are telling people in Israel to return to God. They're warning of what is about to come. They're explaining why. They're trying to get as many people back into the boundaries of God's love as, as possible and explaining everything to them. The entire world will know them for their message is for them too. The globalized people will reject this completely. Notice verse 6. They are given power to execute judgment so no rain falls and turn waters in the blood. They strike the earth with all plagues. Now compare with the first four trumpets sounding and the fire mingled with blood and, and the burned up one third of the trees and grass. That's the crops of the world, the commodities of the world. A third of the seas becoming blood. A third of the fresh water turned bitter. The sun is struck. So a day and night did not shine their light. Yeah. Famine and one third of the world hits. Mass, mass casualty to their economic system saying, hey, you global cabal, you really think you own the world and can make utopia without God in your control freakinish that takes liberties and freedoms away from people? All the while, they're telling people, the two witnesses, all the while, the two witnesses are going to be telling people to return to God and the Gentile world where rejects and hates them all the more because how could they do this? I mean, love is love and, and, and we're under the rainbow flag. How dare God judge us? We have the rainbow flag saying that God will never execute judgment on our lifestyle because he's a loving God. You know, we, we, you know, we got to let the criminals on the street to be fair and imprison uh, granny for not wearing a mask. We got to tackle you and beat you to a pulp if you don't agree with it. We need to take your free speech away because we know best for you how to live your life. So the two witnesses are, are telling all these things and what's going on. And like it says, and other scholars agree that a lot of people in Israel are going to return back to God, like the 144,000 Jewish evangelists we heard earlier talk about in the book of Revelation. And we'll hear a little bit later on in the book of Revelation called the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. These two witnesses are going to affect them. So bring people into the kingdom of God. So at the end of a three and a half years, look what happens to the two witnesses. In verse seven, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in morality and Egypt, slavery, bondage, where also our Lord was crucified. I'm reading out of the New King James. 
Folks, the hallmark of Luciferianism is sexual abuses of all ages. Look at some of the great democratic uh, donkeys that we have out there running for how, 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 how many sexual abuse cases and sexual harassment charges are just glossed over, don't ignored, especially Biden's, just ignored. You know, 13.7 million Democrats regret voting for Biden and want to take back their vote because if they would have heard the news media would have told them about the sexual assault that Biden is guilty of, as well as the crimes he committed in China, with China, they would have never voted for him. But the media is complicit. You have a global cabal working. It's not a conspiracy. It's a reality. So the hallmark of Luciferian is abuse of all ages, even kids, even sex trafficking. All Why do they do this? It's done to acquire power so that they can torment and torture these individuals in order to be inhabited with more evil spirits so they get more and more raw power. That's all it's about. Power, 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 power. They do so to bring all under their control and bondage as their personal plaything, for they know better how to live your life than you do. This is what's seen in the days of Jesus in Jerusalem, the Pharisees and scribes. Can you imagine what some of these people were doing? You think the Roman church is bad? Roman Catholic church is bad with the Jesuit Pope we have who just glosses over and lets the sexual predators go free in the church and not even do too much about it just to show. You have cardinals in the Catholic church warning of this guy and no one's paying attention and they're getting away with it. Do you know why they're doing it? You think, and that's why that's why that says that in that verse, because Jerusalem, the crucified, were the place where they crucified the Lord at that time were influenced by the Luciferian thought. They brought in what we would call the what we modern would would call the New Age movement or a form of an agnosticism into the Jewish practices and brought an emperor worship into the into the second uh, second temple period. They brought that into the synagogues. You go to some synagogues in Israel, the archaeological excavations have revealed that they have an altar there for the emperor in the synagogues. So just to verify why that's there. You have sexual abuse was rampant. Jesus addressed it. He says, you know, the Pharisees and scribes, you know, they get, they get a divorce at a drop of a hat. Why? Because they were sexually abusive. They throw away their wife to get another one or how many, one after another. You get the picture. And they want to bring people under slavery and bondage of strict legalism. Okay. And Jesus died exposing the nature of evil, how evil betrays, abandoned, neglects, stabs in the back, how it puts on, tri on trial, bears false witness, and wants to crucify everything that is good. And that's what happens to the two witnesses. The same thing happens. They're actually doing very good, and a lot of miracles are happening around them, and nobody's listening to them, but they're a warning. And they want these people dead. They finally get their way. They again kill goodness. Two witnesses. Two witnesses to establish a matter as fact. And God as the third witness for the bowls of wrath that will come. So these people in the world hate these two witnesses for exposing who and what they're really like. And who expose their game plan. These are people who love. Don't think they're innocent. They love the murder of babies, taking away a free speech, taking away a free freedom of movement from you, freedom of property owning, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience. They want to take freedom from you, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest. They want to take your protesting rights away from a tyrannical government. They want to take freedom away from you. They want to take away the checks and balances of government. They want to take away free and fair elections. They hate the idea of being innocent until proven guilty. That takes too long. You're guilty. We need to get rid of you. We'll stack the evidence. If it's untrue, we'll bear false witness to kill you because you are an enemy of our utopia. How dare you expose us? People have bought, have been brought into bondage of a new world order as the World Economic Forum article says. Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. 
know where I can go and not be registered. I do. I know that somewhere everything I do can dream of is being recorded. I just hope that nobody will use it against me. Wow. Because it came so clear, we could not continue with the same model of growth and capitalism. All, all these terrible things happen. Lifestyle diseases, climate change. Well, I got to stop here. When has climate never stopped changing? I, I don't know. You think you can control the weather, you arrogant snobs? Well, I'm going to get off on a rabbit trail. We're going to solve the refugee crisis by, guess what? Taking away your personal property rights and saying, hey, you know, come on in. You know, you you're, you got three rooms in your house. You're going to take uh, some, some sexual predators in your house. You're going to set up this, this family can't speak English. You're all going to live together. And if you don't like it, we're going to kick you out and take over your house. You live in this little apartment crammed in with a whole bunch of other people because we love you. Oh, yeah. I forgot. That's, a, that's how they solve the refugee crisis. That's how they did it in Russia and, and Cuba and China and so forth, etc. They could solve the environmental debt, degradation. Wow. They're going to uh, solve completely congested cities. How? By eliminating excess populations. Wow. These people believe that lie. They've been globalized. They, uh, people have been changed. Well, they're no longer living before God and being responsible before God and each other. And this, and they don't even realize they're being brought into bondage to become a mere pawn, a serf, a drone zombie of the state who feeds me, feeds me, feeds me, give me what I want from the breast of government. People right now are being groomed to give up their freedoms in exchange for a lie. The two witnesses here expose the lies. And, dem and demonstrate this with power from on high. God's saying, enough is enough. Well, listen up, turkeys. So look at the Revelations 11, verse 9 and 10. Then those from all peoples, tribes, and tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and will not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. They were able to call out fire. And, you know, could you imagine standing up to Nancy Pelosi and torturing her? <laughs> These people are happy to destroy the last vestiges of hope a mankind has in God. This will usher in a terrible time of utter, complete darkness with utter narcissistic contempt as the supreme rule of the land. Revelation 11, verses 11 and 12 says this, and 13 and 14. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into the two witnesses, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemy saw them. Verse 13 and 14. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and the earthquake. Seven thousand people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was past. Behold, the third woe was coming completely. I'll talk about the woes in a later chapter because there's three woes mentioned here. And I'm going to talk about those later. The book of Revelation, you got to remember, was written in the frame of eternal time. Okay. This great earthquake is mentioned all throughout the book of Revelation. And they're particular, it's, going to, it's going to happen in different periods of time. And there's going to be the last one when Jesus sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. Okay, so when is verse 13 and 14 happen? This happens probably in the middle of the tribulation. It looks like it concerns Israel, and it also has the, um, the remarkable effect of people giving glory to the God of heaven, meaning they, they must, there's something going on here that brings them back to, to God in all of this. What that is, is mere speculation on my part. I'm not going to go into that in this lesson. That, that subject is going to come up later as we get into the study. I'm going to save it for them. So, so book of Revelation was written in the frame of eternal time, okay? Because all of a sudden we come to Revelation 11, 15, talking about the seventh trumpet sounding. And you got, just follow me for a second. The seventh trumpet will only sound last, as it says in Revelation 11, 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever and ever. This talks about the time when the millennial reign happens, or you can also refer, you know, that's what it refers to, okay? It refers to some other things, but right here, 
this talks about the time where some scholars, and including myself, um, uh, speculate here. I'm just saying speculate that this is the white throne judgment period of that time in world history. Jesus comes back in the millennial reign, and uh, it's a time when the white throne happens and the trumpet sounds and everything is finished. So the seventh trumpet, this is all not linear, linear time. This is eternal time. So you have the judgment seals being unleashed and six of the seven trumpets sound. You have seven thunder sound, like I talked about earlier. Seven trumpet doesn't sound. It's going to say for the last. And then the two witnesses, what that happened to them is going to spur in the next thing called the bowls of wrath. And so, so you have these um, um, periods. You have everything divided into a one, two, three, four thing. You have uh, four of the judgments, four of the trumpets, four, the first four of the bowls of wrath are all related to the same things. The next two uh, trumpets are bowls of wrath are related to the same theme okay and the last is this what god's going to do about it okay so the seventh trumpet here sounds that god's going to answer all the how long it's taken care of but before that there between the um see the, the sixth and the seventh of the trumpet or the judgments or the bowls there is a pause so right now we the book of Revelation from now on is going to explain in Revelation 12 on up to 19 what happens in that pause when the bowls of wrath are going to be released. All this stuff, it's going to talk about the pause because there's a pause here before that last trumpet sounds. That last trumpet is found in Revelation chapter 20 when it's going to sound, when all everything is done and Jesus is back, okay? So this is eternal time. That's what confuses people. So the old uh, way they uh, they wrote, I don't remember the rules of grammar. It's been so long that I um, forgot some of the stuff. But the ancient writings were written, and what I remember was the, the dramatic, a dramatic thing. Like in Genesis chapter 1, it's dramatic. God said, let there be light. And then it goes back to uh, to explain the dramatic. I, I call it, it provides the explanation in Genesis chapter 2 how he created and what goes on and goes to a dramatic then goes back to explanation and that's what the book of revelation is doing so here you got the dramatic chapters coming up and all of a sudden you have the pauses happening and this is going to the next chapters 12 up to whatever is it 17 or something whatever i don't remember right off the bat 17 or 19 is, is what happens during the pause before the last trump So, so the next scene in Revelations chapter 11, verse 16, goes right back to what we've seen about the throne room of God. What we will see later happen in Revelation chapter 15 in the throne room of God, where the final bowls of wrath are tossed upon the lost and the wicked world that wants the globalist mindset, despite one third of the world being brought up, burned up, and soon another third is going to be destroyed. And all the world's elites do not control a ding dong thing. Okay? So we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 11, verse 16. And the 24 elders who sat before the Lord on their thrones fell on their faces, worshiped the Lord, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, because you have taken your great power and reign. In other words, you've answered the how longs. You're going to set the matter right. And they and explain why in verse 8. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. This happens at the white throne judgment connects to the last trump. That's why I, I, that's why I say what I said there. And then we're going after this, we're going to chapter 12, we're going to look at a pause, how all this came about, the explanation. This is a dramatic scene. So, all this is found in Psalms 2, 
where Psalms 2 verses 1 through 3 says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain thing and the kings of the earth set themselves against the, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. If you're wise, you'll understand what I'm saying. The two witnesses came. They were anointed of the Lord. Okay. Uh, God's people, the church, has come. We're anointed of God. And we're treated with contempt by the world. And we want anyone to silence us. Okay. They want to silence all goodness, all freedom all liberty they want to set up their own kingdom where they control it all because they have the illusion that they control all the world's commodities and they can make a better world than god can because god just too slow we need a new order we need a synthetic world as alice bailey would write or hp blavatsky would write we need a synthetic world we need androgyny we need freedom we need we know how to live your life better than you do with this new world utopia of uh a brand of centralized planning, i.e. communist, Italian fascism, you know, is the best way because we get things done. Chuck Schumer would say, we take over the Senate, we're going to control the world. Wow. So why do nations rage and people plot vain things and set themselves against the, uh, uh, the Lord and his anointed? So let us break in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We don't need God. We don't, we don't want to live responsible before God and man. We want man to be responsible to live toward the state, us. Folks, these people are the people who love to kill the unborn. They're not your friend. They believe in benevolent genocide. They want to take your liberties away. They want to take your freedom away. They want to take your free speech, your right to raise their families as families. They want to take your personal property away. They, they, they do not want any freedom of worshiping the Lord God Almighty. They don't want nothing to do with living responsible before God and man so we can live responsible before each other. That's what the Ten Commandments were about, teaching us how to live responsible before God, how to live responsible for each other in the boundaries of God's love. That's why Jesus says all the commandments are fulfilled by the royal law of love. Okay. These people don't want any personal freedom or right. And no fair trial at all. They, they, don't, they don't want any right of redress or re, a grievance against a government abuse of power. They want total tyrannical control. These people want to reshape the world into the devil's hellhole of control. But as Psalms chapter 2 verses 4 through 7 say, He who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord or Yahweh will hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in their, with his deep displeasure. Yet have set my king on my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are a son. Today I have begotten you. Verses 8 here through 12. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are those who put their trust in him. In other words, you want strict, tyrannical control, you got it, baby. And they ain't going to like it. And they lost their control. Half, what, two-thirds of the world's resources are gone. Here's the only one who, who owns it all, who can bring it all back. Now you get the picture. While the... Uh, People in heaven and the angels were singing, were singing this. And then, and the 24 elders sat before God on their thrones, fell on their faces, worshiped God. That's Revelation 11, 16, verse 17 says, We give you thanks, O Lord Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, because you have taken your great power and you reign. The last trumpet sound, the dead are being judged. All this is happening. And now the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our God. At last, at last, no more sin, no more sickness, no more dying, no more devil. Hallelujah. We got rid of it. Okay. That's why they were praising the Lord. No more killing of babies. No more of this junk at all. No more of these people plotting against you, trying to control everything. All the control freaks, all the abusers gone. All their crimes exposed. You'll be witnesses against what they've done to you if they don't repent. Revelations chapter 11, verse 19 ends of this note. 
Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightning, noises, thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. Now, a lot of people have conjectures about that verse. I don't, I don't I can go through them, but this could mean the time of possibly, I'm not saying it is, it could possibly refer to the time when the new heavens and earth come about. Okay, after the millennial is over and the devil's released, okay? Or it could refer to Revelation chapter 16, 21, too, about the bowls of wrath being undone and all this stuff. We'll, we'll look at these a little further. It could also mean both. I mean, there's layered meanings in the text. There's, and this is written in eternal time. So what will be seen in that the temple of God is open? In other words, you will see God. <laughs> and the Ark of His Covenant will be seen in the temple. You will see it, okay? And, and no longer is there going to be a veil covering it. The whole earth will see this. And, and they will see lightning, noises, and unthunderings, and earthquakes, and great hail, okay? When the great day of the Lord has come, okay? That's all I can say about that verse. Amen. So with that, we'll finish up. I am done. Close out my scriptures. Well, with that, folks, that's it for today's message. Till next time on The Christian Marauder, as we explore Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation. With that, you can look at my contact information at the end of this. I'm going to post it here. And with that, uh, roll out the video. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Hope you enjoyed this <laughs> recorded live stream. Amen and amen. God bless.